This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome. From Johannesburg in South Africa, it is the city of gold, the economic hub of sub-Saharan and South Africa. Good morning to you. I'm Ibn Janssen. The show is live. It's broadcast from our studios in Auckland Park here in Johannesburg. We're also streaming live on YouTube right now with the whole show available on our YouTube channel all of the time. Well, today we look at the U.S.-Africa summit taking place in the U.S. this week. What does it mean for us? And also, what does it mean to be a global citizen and how does it affect you? Then a bit later, we'll introduce you to Mrs. South Africa, if you've never met her before. First, though, Katrine will give us a news update. Welcome to Newsroom, I'm Katri Malan and let's take a look at the top stories this morning. US President Barack Obama's administration is working to strengthen ties with Africa at a three-day summit in Washington for some 50 African heads of state. Yesterday's opening forums touched on a range of issues including security, health, the environment and corruption. At one panel focused on trade, South African President Jacob Zuma urged the United States to renew the trade agreement, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, when it expires next year. We appreciate the presence to date of about 600 U.S. firms in South Africa, providing around 150,000 full-time jobs and approximately 75,000 indirect jobs. President Obama is scheduled to address a U.S. Africa business forum today and take part in sessions focused on economic growth, regional security and good governance tomorrow. Obama believes it's time that Americans change the way they think about the African continent. And the summit reflects a principle that has guided my approach to Africa uh, ever since I became president. That the security and prosperity and justice that we seek in the world cannot be achieved without a strong and prosperous and self-reliant Africa. A 24-year-old man is expected to appear in the Sophia Town Magistrates Court this morning following the shooting of a three-year-old boy in Westbury, Johannesburg over the weekend. Luke Tebbets is in a critical condition in hospital after getting caught in a crossfire of a gang shootout at the weekend. He was sitting on his mother's lap at the back of a vehicle when the incident occurred. Members of the Westbury community have vowed to protest when the man appears in court. The South African Football Association and the SABC will continue their discussions today regarding media reports that the rights to national football team matches have been sold to a competing broadcaster. The meeting resolved that SAFA and the SABC will establish two groups to discuss matters of operational and legal concerns to both parties. The two say they have a long-standing partnership and the public broadcaster moved to dismiss fears that national games will be lost to the majority of South Africans from 2015 onwards. It is only SABC who reach more than 26 million daily so. So it is important that we as SABC, we make sure those rights are within SABC. We are going to compete with other uh, 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 broadcasters, but our view is those sports of national interest it should be broadcast on SABC platform. And a 72-hour Egyptian plan truce between Israel and Palestinian groups in Gaza comes into force this morning. This after the ceasefire was brokered by Egyptian mediators late yesterday. There have been several truces called during the conflict, but few have lasted, with each side accusing the other of violations. Gaza officials say the four-week conflict has killed 1,800 Palestinians. Some 67 Israelis have also died. Remember, all these top stories are available on our Newsroom Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Evan, over to you. Thanks, Katrin. Yeah, it's day two of the annual three-day U.S.-Africa summit in Washington today. America's three-day summit on Africa is likely to generate a couple of headlines this week as political and business leaders gathered to discuss trade, investment, security and then governance issues on the continent. The summit, initiated by U.S. President Barack Obama, will also discuss the renewal of the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Now, joining us from our studio in Cape Town, Firstly is Professor Nicholas Bigpi from the African Growth Institute. Good morning to you, Professor Bigpi. 
Good morning, Evan. And then uh, with me here in studio in Johannesburg is Christopher Wood, who is a researcher in economic diplomacy at the South African Institute of International Affairs. Good morning, Christopher. Thank you morning. for being here as well. If I can start with uh, you, Professor, in Cape Town, I want to, to ask you your remarks, uh, uh, the latest on what we saw from yesterday's summit, anything that you found interesting or, or unexpected, or is it business as usual? I think uh, a lot of development. Uh, yesterday's meeting was focusing on uh, uh, what the U.S. and then, uh, in fact, the whole meeting will be uh, discussing around that, but what U.S. and Africa can do to have sustainable cooperation. Uh, issues around then uh, 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 agriculture and infrastructure development, and then uh, issues to do with governance and whatnot. So those are, those are a precursor for what's going to happen today and then the final day. But uh, these are not new, and I think that uh, what is going to be important is how these things evolve and what the final outcome would be. How each, each party would then take that. When I say each party, I mean Africa and the U.S., we take that going forward. But that wasn't new. I think uh, we expected that to be what the U.S. government has been thinking and what Africans uh, want to uh, uh, agree on or not agree on, on on the way going forward. Christopher, if I can come to you here in Johannesburg, what, what do you think are the core issues that firstly South Africa and then wider Africa would want to be addressed or addressing at the summit? Well, I think priority number one is going to be the renewal of the African Growth and Opportunity Act which allows African countries to get duty-free access into the American market, which basically makes our product slightly more competitive in the world's biggest market relative to those coming from Asia or from Latin America. So it's very important that it gets renewed, particularly with expiration coming up in September next year. 62,000 jobs are on the line in South Africa alone. So lobbying Congress to, to really work hard on renewing that is definitely on the agenda. And then beyond that, I think there's a lot of supplementary initiatives that are going on particularly the Power Africa initiative, yeah. uh, which the Obama administration aims to boost African electrical capacity uh, over the next few years. So I think other initiatives like that are going to come up as well. The, the AGOA renewal, how, how long do you think we'd be asking for that deal to be extended going into the future? Well, South Africa is asking for 15 years. I think that's perhaps a, an initial bargaining chip to try and get 10 years extension. But it's important that we have a longer extension because if you're an investor looking to spend a whole lot of money on building a factory in Africa, you need to be able to know that you're going to have market access for a longer period of time. You're not going to put in a whole bunch of money if you're going to lose it after five years. Yeah. So there needs to be the certainty generated by a long-term renewal, and hopefully Congress is going to be open to that. Professor Bigfoot, if I can come to you, yesterday uh, President Jacob Zuma declared that South Africa is open for business. Uh, is South Africa still going to be uh, a, a gateway into Africa for the American, uh, big American business? I think the dynamics is changing, but uh, when you look at the continent, South Africa is the most developed. But uh, only recently Nigeria has caught up with South Africa. And if you look at the development, the, uh, the kind of uh, benefit that the U.S. is getting from Africa, is, it was mainly oil uh, with Angola and Nigeria. But then when you look at in terms of other diversified goods or South Africa, so South Africa will always play a very important role. But that's no longer the, going to be the case for a very long time. We've got Kenya on the one hand, East Africa, that is doing very well. And the West African region, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, and the rest are doing well. So the cake is going to be divided. In fact, it's amazing that I was joking with a friend Yesterday was the president there, so I don't know whether the Africans are buying the cake or, or, the, or, or, the, or the president. But I think there is a lot, uh, other than just a lot of countries in the continent, that, uh, South Africa, uh, that the U.S. government will be looking at, not just South Africa as, as, as a single country. But, they, of course, it's still the most developed country in the continent. Christopher, to come to you, South Africa's chief diplomat yesterday uh, in the U.S. sort of hinted to the fact that the U.S. has lagged behind in its engagement with Africa in recent times, focusing rather on individual countries and, and then maybe lagging behind some, of, some other BRICS partners that the continent now has. What are your views in this, first, and do you, do you agree with that? Absolutely. I, th I definitely agree with that. I mean, this is the first major leaders' summit that the United States has ever hosted with African leaders. Meanwhile, Chinese, China has had the Forum for, for China-Africa cooperation for a few years now, the European Union has a long-standing summit relationship, and even new players, the likes of Turkey and Japan, are getting into the game of meeting with African leaders. So this is definitely, to some extent, competitive pressure for the U.S. to catch up. 
But I also think it's just a pure recognition that Africa is growing, Africa is changing. And that if the United States wants to make sure they're part of the Africa rising story, and if they want to take advantage of that, they need to build stronger diplomatic ties with the continent. Professor Bigby, is it as simple as, as a, a mutual beneficial relationship going forward with uh, uh, American companies in the future being able to tap into African economies to sell their products and, and, and we benefiting on the back of that? It can be simple if uh, the bottlenecks are unlocked. You know, trade negotiations and trade relationships is something that is always enshrined in political uh, brinkmanship, you know. Uh, if the, if uh, America and Africans really, really want to take this forward in a way that they will have mutual benefit, that can happen. But you know, in America, you've got a two-party state there where Congress dictates sometimes what happens uh, around the world. Uh, but I think the, 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 the doors and eyes are beginning to open from both continents, where America realized that uh, Africa is very important now, if you look at the president is uh, half, half African. Uh, that go and there's millions of African Americans and other people who are interested in the continent. So the need for uh, the, the, the bottlenecks to be open is, is, is growing. As my co uh, colleague mentioned, uh, China and uh, other emerging markets are looking to Africa in a way that uh, wasn't the case 10, 20 years ago. So, so it's actually important in American interest that an African government's interest that they actually. Uh, ensure that this relationship goes forward and, and goes forward very quickly. Okay, can come to Christopher. Yeah, this discussion, of course, trade is directly linked to other, other discussions around security and, and governance on the continent and so forth. And this would be crucial for, for this partnership to be a success. Where do you think are the worrying scenarios on the continent and, and, and where would the red flags be for South Africa? Well, I think for South Africa particularly, it's going to be on the trade issues. I mean, so security and governance issues have been a long-standing bedrock of the United States relationship with Africa. But I think the, the efforts on that area have kind of been exhausted. The United States is already so involved militarily, for example, in fighting terrorism um, that they, there isn't much scope to progress on that. But there is a lot of scope to improve trade linkages. I think the big red flags, the big concerns will be firstly that there's diversification away from just sending natural resources to the United States. Yeah. And we have seen some progress with that in South Africa, for example, which sends a lot of manufactured goods. It's also going to be some red flags on agriculture, which is, of course, something that the continent is very good at and has a great deal of capacity to expand on, but which is consistently blocked by the fact that the United States subsidizes their agricultural interests. And it makes it very difficult for African manufacturers to gain access to the market. Finally, uh, Dr. Big Pe well, Professor Big Pe I want to come to you and ask you, uh, do you see Africa becoming a manufacturing hub and a, and a secondary player in the, uh, in, in the world of raw goods? I see that, but then it depends on our leaders. Uh, when they travel for these events and then they meet, uh, my colleague mentioned uh, China, they go to China, go to Turkey, South Korea. When they come back, uh, what they bring back to, the country, to their country is very important. We can't keep exporting raw materials around the world. Uh, no country has ever developed uh, just around that. So the value addition for African uh, 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 products is very, very important. And South Africa is benefiting from it. If you look at the Agoya Treaty, I mean, Agoya uh, Partnership, 75% 70, 70 of uh, uh, finished goods from this country goes re to, to the UK. So if other African leaders can do that, then uh, again, then I will see the content do, uh, maturing and then becoming a a region where we can stand on our own two feet. If not, in the next 10, 20 years, we'll be doing what we are doing today. Professor, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Finally, Christopher, if I can, if I can ask you just to wrap up the, the discussion and, and, and tell us about this outlook and, and, and where do you see uh, us developing this relationship with the U.S. or as a global player, really, in the next two decades? I think the key message is that the U.S., the America of 25 years from now, is going to be perfectly suited to the Africa of 25 years from now. 25 years, we're going to have a large middle class wanting consumer goods. We're going to have advanced companies wanting services. And those are the things that the U.S. is good at providing. So if we build a strong diplomatic relationship now, it can give us a strong economic partnership in the future. Thank you very much, Christopher. Short and sweet and to the point, I love that. That is a researcher in economic diplomacy at the South African Institute of International Affairs. And then in Cape Town, we have uh, Professor Nicholas Bigby from the African Growth Institute. Thank you very much for joining us today, gentlemen. And just to recap, politicians cannot grow economies alone. Business is central to this critical process. These were the words of President Jacob Zuma 
as he addressed the United States Chamber of Commerce African Business Initiative in Washington yesterday. The president is on a charm offensive to grow trade and investment in the country and the continent. His message, a simple one. South Africa is open for business, open for tourism, and open for partnerships in many sectors. We appreciate the presence to date of about 600 U.S. firms in South Africa, providing around 150,000 full-time jobs and approximately 75,000 indirect jobs. The increase in new projects proves that South Africa is a profitable place to invest in. Our country is also a great location for growing your business in other parts of the African continent. President Zuma told his business audience that South Africa had made the economy an apex priority over the next five years, highlighting a number of investment sectors, including an ever-expanding energy sector, agro-business and processing, and a labor-absorbing manufacturing sector, among others. He also argued for a GOA's extension and for South Africa's inclusion in it. He called a GOA a cornerstone of trade relations between the U.S. and sub-Saharan Africa. Discussion at a ministerial level on AGOA has so far yielded positive results, with a broad consensus developing on its extension, possibly before the end of the year. Sherwin Bryceby's SABC News, Washington. You can follow Sherwin on Twitter, mind you, and of course, we'll keep you updated, or all of us updated, as to what develops at the US-Africa Summit over the next week. Let's take a quick look at what you're talking about on social media. Of course, many of you are following the summit itself. Pauline Njoroge says, we can only hope that Africa has set its agenda prior to the US-Africa summit, not waiting for Obama to set and drive the agenda. Pauline, I think this time we're going there with great gusto. Chepo says, uh, real or perceived competition between the US and China in terms of investment in Africa is good for the continent. Yes, very well put there. Ndai says, the only thing some of these African leaders will get from the US-Africa summit is a picture with Obama. Sad but true. And Dai, we should not be so negative. This is Africa's century after all. Al Sante uh, says Africa diaspora, if you have a good education, good work experience and strong work ethic, return to Africa on your own terms. US Africa Summit says Al Sante, very sober view there. I love that. Sometimes Solomon says US Africa Summit looks like the US is waking up a little too late as China seems to have taken over as the biggest business partner of the continent. Yes, indeed, sometimes, Solomon, very well put. America realizes that, well, growth, six of the ten fastest economies in the world are on the African continent. Where are they going to sell their products in the next 50 years in, in Africa? One in four of every people on the planet in 2050 will be living on the African continent. That's the reality of where we are as a continent. So the next 100 years will be the African century if we mind our business properly. Let's take a quick look at what's happening on the front pages from around the world. Of course, the vanguard in Nigeria looking at the reported three new Ebola cases in Nigeria. This is a major concern as the total death toll from the disease in West African countries shot up to 887. Very concerning, that is. Then in New York... The Daily News is also looking at the story of a man being tested for possible Ebola after visiting West Africa last month. Of course, the one American person has been treated. The, the Inter International New York Times is looking at the situation in Gaza. No surprises there with the front page picture of Palestinians crawling through the rubble during continued fighting and bloodshed there. And I can tell you that latest pictures coming out of the country and reports from our very own doctors that are there are that they don't feel very safe because it seems as if the Israeli military are even attacking humanitarian workers in the Gaza Strip. So very concerning, not just for them, but also for the wider world. Now, time for us to take a look back. This week, 18 years ago, a march against organized crime by the Western Cape based Muslim organization, People Against Gangsterism and Drugs, PAGAD, 
resulted in the killing of Rashad Stahi, leader of the hard living gang at the time. Stahi was set alight by the group and eventually shot dead in the road. Despite Paget claiming they only wanted to warn him, it later became apparent that the intention was to end his life. However, others believe Paget was behind the selling of drugs themselves and wanted to remove those deemed stumbling blocks like Stachy was in the case. The following clip we found on YouTube is part of a documentary about Rashad Stachy and his twin brother Rashid. It was filmed in 1993. Leave me alone. You will always see I drive alone. I don't drive with people. Why not? On the bus! <laughs> Did you know I'm the boss? She laughed. Did you think I, 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 I'm, I'm actually joking? They respect me for that, because I have to steal one side. And they do all the dirty stuff. The HLs is a very poor, poor people, you see. They haven't got money, they haven't got nothing. And now they use me to get the money, and I have to split it with them. And Rashid got a different apartment. Rashid is a violence one. He like to fight. He like to build these people. He likes power. I don't like power. I like money. But you know, I see this is a mad dog. He's a very mad dog. He want to do the things himself. Shoot people, he want to shoot himself. But I see this is the most powerful leader. All the other leaders from gangs, they, you know how afraid they are for a seat because a seat is a coward. He can talk with you now, then he kill you. The seat actually feel nothing for you. You know what? We had Bad gang fights here. Oh, you should have seen a seat, how crew he is. You see? I'm blind in this eye. It's blind, blind. They poke me in my eye. They poke me here. Uh, other shots, they poke me. But I fight with them. I, I get the power to fight with them. When I ask him, hey, what's the matter with you? They didn't uh, tell me nothing. They just take the knife up, poke me like that. Go oh, on like that. So I have to, yo, it was bad. I feel lucky in Menembe. I feel lucky with the poor people. I feel very lucky because we are a hard livings. We are in this people, hard livings. But I don't remember I'm the boss. <laughs> two years, less than two years after that, the boss himself was shot and set to light outside his home in Woodstock in Cape Town. His brother Rashid went to prison later on rape charge. He's been released from prison earlier this year, but it seems as if he's due back on his way to prison. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. We'll be back after a short commercial break. is about the new and how about the new cabinet uh, will actually perform but what role should then the media be playing at this critical stage I, I would hope that media will give the newly appointed people a benefit of the doubt has the media lost its respect in this regard we want you to tell us the many factors that are hidden from the public in terms of this ought to be brought out by the media watch media monitor with me alicia jali sundays at 9 a.m only on the sabc news channel
SABC News, we've got Africa covered. You're watching live pictures from Johannesburg in South Africa. The traffic, well, matters are improving on the highways in the economic hub of Southern Africa. As you can see, traffic free flowing around the highways and byways of Johannesburg. That's the M1, as you see, coming into the city. Of course, peak hour now starting to dissipate as the city gets busy on the day's work ahead. Now, global citizen, global lifestyle are terms that seem to be popping up in every lifestyle business travel magazine these days. It uh, typically defines a person who places their identity within a global community above their identity as a citizen of a particular nation or place. Are we as South Africans also moving towards this generation trend? More importantly, what are the challenges involved? How safe is my South African passport once I gain citizenship of another country? Now, on the show today, to answer all these questions and more, we joined from our Cape Town studio by Andrew Taylor, the vice chairman of Henley & Partners, the global leader in citizenship by investment programs. Good morning, Andrew. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Evan. Can South Africans gain citizenship of, other, of another country at the moment? Does, is the outlook that good? Certainly. Uh, there's many different programs out there. Uh, citizenship by investment programs and residence by investment programs exist. And basically for those with financial means to make investments overseas, uh, there's a lot of countries that are available to acquire citizenship through Malta, Cyprus, St. Kitts and Nevis, Antigua. Uh, there's a lot of programs that allow investors to acquire citizenship of their choice. Now, Andrew, young people are often most keen to live and work abroad. Is it, is it then advised for them to, to gain citizenship of another country? And if so, why? Yeah, most of our clients are planning for their children's future or their future children. Uh, so they, they're investing in acquiring, say, European citizenship. And once you acquire European citizenship through investment, it's a very straightforward process. Uh, then you acquire the right to live work and study anywhere in Europe and that right can be passed on to your children through descent. Uh, if you marry in the future, uh, basically these benefits uh, can apply to your family. So these, uh, these are the benefits that are being acquired. We talk about global lifestyle and the global citizen. Just describe this to us in a little bit more detail and, and, and would you say that it's uh, the, the next or the current generation? Sure, definitely. People are traveling a lot more these days uh, and living a global jet-setting lifestyle. Uh, our firm produces the Henley & Partners Visa Restriction Index and South Africans can travel to 97 countries uh, without a visa. Uh, that is compared to, say, Malta, which you can travel to 166 countries without uh, a visa. So through acquiring alternative citizenship, your ability to travel freely and, and as a global citizen uh, becomes a lot easier uh, by holding multiple passports. You yourself have first-hand experience of being a global citizen. Just, just tell us of, of how it's benefited you, uh, uh, the living and working in different countries and so forth. Certainly. Uh, I can date it back more than 10 years when uh, I worked in Canada, educated in Canada, I hold two passports, uh, my old Canadian and a British passport, and uh, I got a job offer once that uh, couldn't be refused to travel and work in London. I could immediately pass, pack my bags and I moved to London and took the opportunity as it came. If I needed to fumble around with visas or think about um, how this was going to happen, certainly probably that job opportunity wouldn't have been there. And the much is the same for children with schools. Um, our friends uh, are trying to get their child into school in Germany and have been struggling for three months to get the visas, getting denied time after time for various reasons. Um, holding European citizenship uh, solves this problem completely. Uh, and uh, these types of travel benefits and, and really 
taking advantage of the world is, is what being a global citizen really means today. Andrew, one of the questions that's coming in from our viewers uh, via social media uh, this morning is that people are afraid of losing their South African citizenship if they get citizenship from mm -hmm. another country. Is that the case? And, and what are the legal, the legal aspects involved? Yeah, certainly uh, there is a law that if you acquire citizenship of another country, if it's not through marriage, then automatically you will lose South African citizen unless you acquire permission from the government beforehand. And it's a very standard process. Uh, my wife did it in, uh, in, in Britain, but it's basically forms and a letter to the government requesting approval. Once they issue that approval, then you can gladly hold uh, multiple citizenships. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a, a fantastic lifestyle, uh, and I'm sure one that many people will be interested in. Thank you once again for joining us. That is the uh, Vice President of Henley and Partners, Andrew Taylor, the global leader in global citizenship and investment programs. And it seems as if the two are interlinked. Let's quickly take a look at what's on social media. What are you talking about? What are you passionate about today? A little bit earlier, it was, well, it was uh, the U.S. summit now. Donovan says, I fear for my family and friends in Westbury, nuclear Lord, protect them and guide them, keep them safe from evil. Yes, it seems as if uh, you're in Johannesburg after collateral damage in, uh, in, in uh, Llewellyn Bell. That's our colleague, Llewellyn Bell, Freja Park, with, while our people suffer and children die. Of course, uh, of one of our colleagues, Llewellyn, uh, it was his little nephew was caught in the crossfire that uh, yesterday and our thoughts are with Llewellyn to Jacob says Gauteng Premier appeals for calm as a man prepares to make first court appearance in connection with shooting of a three-year-old boy I think this one is going to escalate somewhat Shane Lowe talks about Lord please help uh, lead us free of the communities from all these forces of injustice terrorizing the lives of our people I suppose is what Shane Lowe is saying there yeah, those are the views, and we want to tell you that our thoughts are with Llewellyn today and his family, of course. Three-year-old nephew was caught in the crossfire and gang violence, and it's all too familiar a story, it seems, in the South African communities that we all live in. Let's take another look at what's happening now on our Facebook page. Today, you will see there that hundreds of troops have been deployed in Sierra Leone and Liberia to quarantine communities hit by the deadly Ebola virus as the death toll from the outbreak has now reached a mammoth 887. Then a 24-year-old man arrested in connection with the shooting of a three-year-old boy and a man in Westbury is expected to appear in the Sapphire Town Magistrates Court today. And then you can read more on what President Jacob Zuma had to say about business relations while addressing the United States Chamber of Commerce African Business Initiative on the sidelines of the United States African Leaders Summit in Washington. You can find all of these stories and more on our Facebook page. Also, we're on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. That's where we live. Now, on this day in 1962, movie actress, immortal Marilyn Monroe was found dead in a home in Los Angeles. After a brief investigation, police concluded that a death was caused by a self-administered overdose of sedative drugs and that the mode of death was probable suicide. Monroe won international fame for his sexy roles in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, How to Marry a Millionaire, and There's No Business Like Show Business. Now, in 1955, the seven-year itch was showcased her comedic talents and features the classic scene where she stands over a subway grating and, well, gyrating larder, rather, and her white skirt bellowed up by the wind from a passing train. Let's take a look at that golden moment of film history. So sorry for the creature at the end. Sorry for the creature? What'd you want him, to marry the girl? He was kind of scary looking, but he wasn't really all bad. I think he just craved a little affection, you know, a sense of being loved and needed and wanted. That's a very interesting point of view. <laughs> oh, do you feel the breeze from the subway? Isn't it delicious? One of the golden moments of a time gone by, some would say, but Marilyn Monroe, the thing we all think will live forever. Time for another break. He'll be back with Newsroom right after this.
BMW M4 Coupe. One with the machine. Have we seen the last of you in politics? I don't know. No, I'm just uh, okay now with the work that I'm doing. Uh, let me just do one thing at a time. So I don't have any plans for politics. Watch Question Time with me, Mpo Tseidu. Monday to Thursday at 5.30 p.m. on the SABC News Channel. Do you think that the media has then fully unpacked of what these strikes could possibly do to the economy if it's going to that extent of a recession? It doesn't mean that when we solve the mining strike that suddenly the GDP is going to go on increase and we're all going to go and have an economic Very boom. True, so yes. we, we've got to go and look at that fact as well. Obviously the media um, you know, can't touch on absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a very complicated situation. Watch Media Monitor with me, Alicia Jali, Sundays at 9 a.m. only on the SABC News Channel. Now, the perfect day in Africa, you wouldn't say it's in the middle of winter here in Johannesburg, the city of gold. Maximum 20 temperature today expected 21 degrees, summer in most parts of the world, one would say. There you have a panoramic view as we go into the economic hub of southern Africa. Welcome from all of us here at Newsroom. If you've just joined us, let's go to Katrine to update, give you an update on the latest news. Oh yes, welcome back. Let's take a look at those top stories this morning. U.S. President Barack Obama's administration is working to strengthen ties with Africa at the three-day summit in Washington for some 50 African heads of state. Yesterday's opening forums touched on a range of issues including security, health, the environment and corruption. At one panel focused on trade, South African President Jacob Zuma urged the United States to renew the trade agreement, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, when it expires next year. We appreciate the presence to date of about 600 U.S. firms in South Africa, providing around 150,000 full-time jobs and approximately 75,000 indirect jobs. President Obama is scheduled to address a U.S. Africa business forum today and take part in sessions focused on economic growth, regional security and good governance tomorrow. Obama believes it's time that Americans change the way they think about the African continent. And the summit reflects a principle that has guided my approach to Africa ever since I became president. That the security and prosperity and justice that we seek in the world cannot be achieved without a strong and prosperous and self-reliant Africa. A 24-year-old man is expected to appear in the Sophia Tal Magistrates Court this morning following the shooting of a three-year-old boy in Westbury, Johannesburg over the weekend. Luke Tibbetts is in a critical condition in hospital after getting caught in the crossfire of a gang shootout at the weekend. He was sitting on his mother's lap at the back of a vehicle when the incident occurred. Members of the Westbury community have vowed to protest when the man appears in court. The South African Football Association and the SABC will continue their discussions regarding media reports that the rights to the national football team matches have been sold to a competing broadcaster. The meeting resolved that SAFA and um, SABC will establish two groups to discuss matters of operational and legal concerns to both parties. The two say they have a long-standing partnership and the public broadcaster moved to dismiss fears that national games will be lost to the majority of South Africans from 2015 onwards. It is only SABC who reach more than 26 million daily so. So it is important that we as SABC we make sure those rights are within SABC. We are going to compete with other uh, 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 broadcasters, but our view is those sports of national interest it should be broadcast on SABC platform. 
and a 72-hour Egyptian planned truce between Israel and Palestinian groups in Gaza comes into force this morning. This after the ceasefire was brokered by Egyptian mediators late yesterday. There have been several truces called during the conflict, but few have lasted, with each side accusing other of violations. Gaza officials say the four-week conflict has killed 1,800 Palestinians. Some 67 Israelis have also died. Remember to find all these top stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Evan, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, again for that update, uh, Katrine, putting us in the picture as to what is happening right now in the world. What are the top stories? Of course, uh, yeah, at SABC News, we look at this story where another farm has been found, this time in the Free State, with starving and dead animals. The SPCA has issued a warning to a Frankfurt farmer in the northern Free State after almost 200 sheep died starvation. Now, SABC reporter Morena van Vek visited the farm and joins us from the city of Roses. Good morning, Morena, and thank you for joining us. Good morning, Eben. Thank you very much. Morena, just give us the, the sort of breakdown of the situation at this Frankfurt farm in the northeast of the Free State Province. Uh, well, Eben, the situation is, is very disturbing at this stage. Uh, on Monday, we saw heaps of dead animals, uh, sheep and lamb. And yeah, uh, uh, the owner of the farm, Marius Hasselman, says the situation evolves because of a lawsuit, an ongoing lawsuit. Uh, following, the, following, the, following his brother being declared insolvent. And because of that, he was not able to feed the animals properly. Now, what's happening uh, currently on the farm? Have the police and the SPC, SPCA moved in to sort of remedy the situation, if that at all is still possible? Well, the SPCA issued a warning on Sunday that the sheep uh, should be fed immediately up until the conclusion of the lawsuit. Otherwise, the, will, the SPCA will continue with a case of most probably animal abuse. Marina, just tell us, uh, as the SPCA indicated that they would uh, take or pursue this matter further, and, and then if they do, what charges would the, would the owner of this farm then be facing? He will be faced with charges of animal abuse at this stage. I spoke to the SABC in Johannesburg yesterday, and they, uh, they confirmed uh, that they're busy with the investigation. Morena, finally, uh, the owner is not allowed on the farm at the moment. Do you know where he is? He is actually uh, on the farm at this stage. He's not allowed to, to move the animals to areas where they can have proper uh, fodder and feeding, especially the eel at this stage and for the lambs. So that is the big crisis at this stage. Morena, thank you very much for joining us this morning and give us an up, giving us an update. Morena will keep us updated as to how that story developed. Very disturbing one. More than 150 sheep allegedly died and lambs are facing the same fate on a farm near Frankfurt in the northeastern parts of the Free State. Uh, the SPCA are on the farm and they're busy attending to the matter. The police, I've been told, have also been called in, which uh, is a little bit disturbing. But now, in conclusion, Anine Dormel, our uh, producer, has found a few finalists of the Mrs. South Africa competition. Very interesting. Stay tuned. That's right, Evan. The month of August is all about paying homage to the women of South Africa. And what better way to do this than honouring some of the women who do it all. Mrs. South Africa finalists are wives, mothers and even successful career and business women between the ages of 25 and 15. The winner who will be crowned this Friday is also a hard-working, confident, feminine and down-to-earth woman with a great vision for South Africa and its people. Now joining us today to talk a bit more about the pageant is Mrs. SA Pageant Director and CEO Joni Johnson and two Mrs. South Africa finalists Lizzie Staffer and Tumi Wasahung. Thank you for joining us, ladies, and coming through all the way. We know you're quite busy, especially <laughs> since the final's taking place on Friday. That's Jenny, fine. I'd like to start with you. Just being a previous winner yourself, what makes this pageant different to any of the other beauty pageants we see? 
I mean, um, we actually sat down this year and we asked ourselves that very same question and we said what makes us different from Ms. SA or any other pageant in South Africa? And that is the fact that we are real women. We um, launched what we called the She Is Bonafide campaign to showcase that Mrs. South Africa ladies are real women. We are mothers, we are wives, we are successful and accomplished career women. And, you know, we do it all. We do the school run, we cook for our families, we uh, have a career, we, you know, we, we real women just trying to be the best versions of ourselves and beautiful with thank that. you <laughs> all right so I also want to know if you now win this title of Mrs. South Africa what will you be doing that Miss South Africa doesn't do with her title we are involved with our official charity cancer the Cancer Association of South Africa so we do a lot of work with them um, but Mrs. South Africa you know she's really there to empower other married women and um, in South Africa and to also show them that you know it, it, does, it doesn't end when you're married um, you can still be successful you can still follow your dreams and we I think Mrs. South Africa initially you know inspires and empowers other married ladies and all women and people in South Africa. Mm. Which brings me to you, Lizzie. You're a mother and the managing director of a security company yes. and the finalist of this pageant. <laughs> How are you managing all of this? Oh, wow. It, as fabulous as it is, um, it's a lot of work. But then remember that you have to balance everything that you do in life. As much as you're a mother and a career woman, everything needs to balance at the end of the day. So it's just all about managing your time and making time for everything because remember you can't only just focus on the pageant itself you also need to do the things that you still keep doing every time as as a normal woman so this pageant is actually to prove that we do um our day-to-day day -to -day duties as wives, as mothers, but then at the same time, yes, we are Mrs. South Africa finalists, and it has been absolutely awesome. I've enjoyed my time, and yes, I've managed to find the time to do it all. So take us through the process. Maybe I can ask you, Jimmy. Um, okay. From start to beginning, what have you been involved in? What have you been doing? Okay, I just want to add that my last name is actually Matejo. My husband will kill me. Oh, I'm so it's sorry. my maiden surname. <laughs> <laughs> okay, from the beginning, my platform has always been to um, encourage um, professionals to give back to their communities, as, uh, to come and speak at career exhibitions, and just to give information to schools who do not have career guidance. So from the beginning, I've been involved with quite a few schools, uh, in the rural areas to speak to them and encourage uh, professionals to go there and speak to these uh, pupils and give them more information on which careers to choose. So from the beginning, that's mostly what I've been doing. And also the cancer initiative from Mrs. South Africa, we've also been a part of that raising funds for cancer, which is the official, um, fun, uh, fun official charity for Mrs. South Africa. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Journey, I know over the past few years this pageant has grown quite a lot, um, but still sometimes people don't know about this Mrs. South Africa pageant. What mm -hmm. are you guys actually doing to put it out there? Do you know what? I mean, I, people ask me this year, what have I done differently? Because all of a sudden, it's just gaining all these media awareness. And it's not what I've done differently. I think it's four years of hard work that's starting to pay off now. And my vision for the company is definitely to eventually have a live broadcast, which I'm sure we'll be able to accomplish next year. And I think the media awareness are really growing, and we are really getting out there and the message out there to the South African public. Okay. And then I just want to end off with the two beautiful mm -hmm. ladies. Finalists, what are you going to... What will you be taking from this experience? Okay. Um, this experience has been, you know, it has been a life-changing experience for me. And the most important thing that I'll be taking with is just the woman that I've become before the pageant. You know, uh, the pageant came at a time in my life where I was really down and I really didn't know where I belonged. So to me personally, it, it, it made me find my inner self and I'm today I'm, I'm a strong woman and I know what I want today because of this pageant so out of everything that I'm taking away I feel that the woman in me is awake and is ready to take over the world and that's what I've Timmy, if yeah, I can course. quickly ask you yeah. the same. For me, I think as married women, I think sometimes we tend to put ourselves in the backseat and just mm. concentrate on the family. So I think it was a time for me to just remember who I am. And I've really grown a lot. And I've had a great support structure that I just want to thank every single day. Well, good luck, wow. ladies. We know the thank finals on so Friday. Much. Have fun and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so, thank much. so much. Evan, back to you.
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Aneen. The picture behind me is the M1, the M1 highway here in Johannesburg. As you can see, traffic is dissipating. It looks as if it's going to be another wonderful day. 21 degrees is expected. It's time for us to say goodbye. You better make this day count. Yeah, our newsroom is broadcast live every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. from our studios here in Auckland Park, Johannesburg. The show repeats at 2 in the afternoon with highlights and rebroadcast the following morning at 5 a.m. We're also live on YouTube at that time with our entire show available on our YouTube channel that is on demand at your leisure at home or in the office. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom. We love it in the morning.